right. So uh, one of my favorite sayings, water drops pierce stone, rope saws cut wood. So patience, you'll get there and it'll be good. And next, oh, that's me. And my sister from another mister, Carmen. All right, next. And there is not a particle of life which does not bear poetry within it. And next. So Dr. Antonio Moya, he was actually supposed to be here, but he is a very, very busy neurologist. Um, he was also named PAA's Distinguished Alumna, Alumna, Alumni Award, uh, this year. Um, what's interesting about him is that he is passionate about um, the health of, of elder, uh, elderly Filipinos. And so he started making um, lots of videos, which is shown on his YouTube channel. So, and he's also the prof assistant professor of neurology at the Keck School of Medicine at, at USC. So he's making the Trojans smarter. Oops. Sorry. My husband was a Trojan. My brother was a Trojan. Mark Polito, you know we have good, we have Trojan friends, right? Yep. Um, so anyway, uh, unfortunately, I don't think he can make it, but we do have another talented doctor in the house. Yeah, and anyone who's on this webinar, if you want to network with Dr. Antonio Moya, he's very kind. And you can just say, hey, I heard about you through the PAA, and I'd love to network or catch up. So, yeah. Oh yeah, one last thing I wanted to talk uh, point out from Antonio is he co-founded co the Council of Young Filipino Americans in Medicine. So um, he's part of that and that may help uh, students, prospective students, if you want to get in touch with that. So it's C-Y-F-A-M, there you go. Okay, now Antoinette Molina, I'm going to mute myself. Antoinette, please introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Antoinette Molina. I graduated in from UCLA in 93 in poli sci with a specialization in Asian American studies. I also have my uh, master's degree in public policy from Georgetown University. Um, so my career has just kind of taken me a lot of different um, directions. <laughs> and I just want to say one of the things I think there's always um, an opportunity for lifelong learning and connection. And I think there's several paths that you can take, um, not only based on your career. So I'm happy to be here and looking forward to getting into more of the questions later. Thank you. Hi hey, everyone. Is, is this is it my turn? Okay. Hi hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Hi. Good to see so many familiar faces here. My name is Danny De Jesus, and I graduated in twenty. Oh, just kidding. When did I graduate? Two thousand. It's been a minute, y'all. It's been a minute. I was supposed to graduate in ninety nine, and of course I was a super senior because that's kind of be going to be kind of a theme that I have when I talked about UCLA is that I didn't want to leave. I really didn't want to leave. I don't know if any of you feel me on that as well, but I have come to realize that I am a perpetual student. If I could get paid to be a student, I would. I'd still be at UCLA learning and taking all the classes because every time I tried something new, then I said, oh, maybe I should major in that. Maybe I should try that. Why don't I minor in that? So this is why I was a double major in poli sci and psychology and an education minor because I couldn't make up my mind and I couldn't just stick to one thing. So I wanted it all. If I could have added a third major or a second minor, I would have. And that's how much I loved UCLA. So um, after I graduated from UCLA, then I jumped right into the um, television industry and worked at a small production company with a UCLA alumni. And that's actually how I got my first job was because of the work that I did at UCLA and alumni um, just shepherding me through and supporting my career. And then um, right in 2007, I moved and I said, you know, so many people that I'm meeting in Los Angeles have the story of having found 
community in LA from somewhere else. I was born in L yeah, born in LA, raised in LA, went to school in LA. So I decided I needed a little bit of a change. And so I went back to school and got my master's in education. And then I moved to um, Hawaii, to the island of Maui. And I lived there for 13 years and um, was a social studies teacher, high school teacher. I still teach. Um, I am also, not only am I a forever student, but I'm a forever teacher. So I'm still an educator. Um, and a few years ago decided something needed to change and needed to shift because I wanted to make an impact in a different way. And so I moved back to Los Angeles and started a production company with my sister and my brother-in-law. And most of our stories are focused on telling um, stories for <clears throat> underrepresented communities, particularly the Filipino community and the Mexican community because we're Filipino and we're Mexican. So it works out that way. But I'm just excited to be here and excited to talk more about the journey because that's also a theme for me is it's a journey. There is no one clear cut path. I am definitely an example of someone that thought they had a path and that completely took a sidestep when I saw people studying for OCHEM and decided that then I wasn't going to be a doctor <laughs> and then became a teacher and now back in the entertainment industry. So I'm all over the place, but I'm making it happen and everything that I am and everything that I do, I 100% attribute to my time at UCLA. So that's it for now. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, Jenny Davis Samala, you're up next. Hi everyone. Um, yeah, nice to meet you all. I've never uh, done any events with uh, PAA, so this is really such an honor. Uh, my name is Jenny Samala. I'm a licensed clinical social worker. Um, I work for an agency called SSG Silver, and I am a provider of mental health services and case management services for older adults in the county of Los Angeles. I especially work with our uh, older adult Filipinos by providing psychotherapy in Tagalog. Well, more like Taglish because my Tagalog isn't perfect, but I try. And my clients recognize it. So it's good enough. <laughs> um, I got my bachelor's in social work from Cal State LA, and I furthered my education by going to UCLA for my master's in social welfare. And throughout my journey, um, I focused my work on the geriatric community, especially on the health and mental health needs of our Filipino elders. Um, social work wasn't my first choice you know, of a career. Actually, my parents really wanted me to be a nurse, as many of our parents probably asked us to be. But the most defining question um, I asked my parents, because, you know, sometimes when you try to so hard to be something that you're not quite sure if you want to be, you really got to uh, spend some time in reflection. So one day, you know, I tried to do all the classes I could, like all the prerequisites, but it just wasn't working out. And one day I asked my parents seriously, you know, you guys, if you guys are on your deathbed and I was your nurse, would you trust me with your life? <laughs> and they couldn't answer. So I was like, all right, I got to change this. So I picked social work because uh, the code of ethics, uh, you know, consists of self-determination, social justice, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, self-determination. And these are values that naturally align with me already. So I chose social work because, well, if I'm going to do something, you know, for the next a de couple decades, might as well be something I'm passionate about. So I chose social work. And in many ways, I think social work chose me. So yeah, excited to be here and to share about the work I do and how this can be an informative um, session for, you know, students and the community. So yeah, nice to meet you all. Thank you. Ivan, you're up next. All right. Hi, everybody. So my name is Ivan. I'm a first year at Fordham University in New York City. So uh, I'm in the Manhattan campus. So I'm right off. I'm of Columbus Circle, if anyone knows where that is. So right by Central Park. Uh, I'm a finance and economics bachelor's of science with a minor in Arabic. 
Um, I will say that my academic journey didn't really begin that way. I originally came in as a neuroscience major and decided very quickly that because um, I wanted to do medicine, that wasn't really for me. And then I quickly changed to math and economics, did a semester of that, and just decided that I wanted something a little more applicable. And at the end, what I'm doing now is finance and economics. And I really think that's the path um, for me. But after a lot of change, and it was all under the first year, so um, a lot's still changing. Aside from just academics, uh, on campus, I'm involved with a bunch of different things, investment club, Arabic club, and I'm starting one next semester uh, called the Balkan Student Union because I'm uh, from Poland and Croatia. So I'm excited to start that and get that going. Uh, off campus though, I am uh, signed with a modeling agency in New York, Strut Model Management, and I've been signed with them for about six months. So um, this was really interesting for me. So aside from just being a normal student in New York, I did have to balance what was, um, a job at some point, especially during times like Fashion Week, which was in February, March. So um, I'm still learning, I'm still figuring it all out. Obviously I'm still in my first year, so I have a lot to figure out, but uh, but yeah, I'm excited to see where uh, school and my job take me and how um, they'll impact each other in the future. Awesome, thank you. Mark Polito, you're up next. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Mark Polito. Uh, I live in Cerritos, it's my hometown for the past 51 years. Um, after UCLA, I um, pursued a life in public service. Um, I served uh, at the local, state and federal levels as a legislative staffer. Um, most recently, uh, I just wrapped up uh, 10 years working for a congressman in Southern California. Um, and I, enjoy, I enjoyed very much serving in local office, giving back to uh, my local community as a member of the local school board for the school district that I attended, and then for uh, uh, the city. Uh, um, and I turned out in the middle of the pandemic, uh, so I'm very much enjoying being a private citizen now. Um, when I was at UCLA, I, I studied history and Asian American studies. And um, since I'm, I've wrapped up uh, 30 years in public service, I'm at the point in my life where I'm making a, a career shift now. Uh, so I'm making preparations in order to teach uh, in higher education. Uh, it'd be a dream if I could teach uh, Uncle Roy's class. Uh, if anyone knows who Uncle Royal Morales uh, was, uh, he taught the Filipino American experience at UCLA. I had the honor to be his his TA back uh, back in the day in the eighties, late eighties. Uh, so that's something that I aspire to do, and I'm uh, very pleased to be here, uh, joined by many uh, sisters and brothers, uh, some that I've known for ages, and uh, some that I'm just meeting here tonight. So thank you for including me, Julianne. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mark. Dr. Mark Sai, you're up next. Hi. Uh, can you see me? I'm not sure because I'm on my phone. My video on? Yes. Okay. Uh, so my name is Mark. Um, yeah, so I graduated in 2009 from UCLA in a bachelor's in psychobiology. Came in undecided in life sciences. And so I knew somewhat in, in science, but wasn't sure what exactly. Um, anyways, so I knew I wanted to do something healthcare, so I actually took a lot of exams. I took the optometry test, the pharmacy test, the dental test, the MCAT three times. Um, finally, I was like, you know, uh, medicine's a little bit more broad, so I decided to just uh, take the leap of faith and go to the Caribbean, which was amazing. I spent two years there um, studying. It was kind of like boot camp in a sense, where you're like stuck on an island, like all these Netflix shows, but studying. Um, but it was a lot of fun, met a lot of people from different parts of the country, um, some of who I still talk to this day. Then I did two years in um, actually New York City, um, all across the five boroughs doing rotation. So it was kind of wild, but um, it was fun. Um, and then also did my internship in Cincinnati. Um, so, you know, coming from California, I'm, look, I'm like, you know, all these different places, which is pretty cool because I 
kind of had an idea of what Ohio would be like. And actually, it's not that bad as like what you would think it would be like from California. Um, anyways, I did a residency in anesthesia in Chicago, which was amazing. Highly recommend Chicago if you haven't been during maybe spring and summer, not the winter. It's very terrible. Um, but food is really good. And a lot of the restaurants are popping up in L.A., uh, which is you know pretty cool to see. Um, um, anyways, I uh, did pediatric anesthesia fellowship at Children's L.A., um, so that's what uh, allowed me to come back to California. So I was, I was actually like, actually not living in California for like about eight years or so. Um, and I have two little boys, a two and a half year old and a eight month old. So I've been pretty busy with that. Um, I actually work as a, a physician with anesthesiology for peds and general at Kaiser LA. So it's kind of funny because, um, you know, Kaiser, it's very, you know, there's a lot of Filipinos there, but LA especially, I feel like I'm in the Philippines. So I'm all with these like titas and titos. And, you know, I do speak uh, fluent Tagalog, which is unique, but um, it's because I lived there for two years. Um, but long story short, um, you know, it's pretty fun at, at work talking to all these um, people in the community. And you know, a lot of them don't know that I speak Tagalog. I don't even mention or advertise. I kind of just wait. And after a course of months, they're like, oh, what? You understand what we're saying this whole time? I'm like, yes, I do. <laughs> So I know if you're talking smack, I know I totally, you know, it's, so it's been kind of a lot of fun. And recently, uh, in terms of career, um, you know, I finally decided I didn't want to do full time um, traditional route, taking 24 hour call. Um, so with the pandemic, it actually is kind of a blessing in disguise for my specialty um, since there's such a huge influx of demand. So I just made the switch to per diem. Um, still doing a lot of hours, but don't have to take call. Um, work hard for one month, take a whole month off and be somewhere else if I wanted to. Having that flexibility, I think, is very important for me. And uh, a lot of priorities kind of change when you've had little kids. And so that's kind of where I'm at. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Sai. Next up, we have Dr. Mehi Hyun. You're up next. Hi, thank you. So I did my, as you can see, lots of degrees at UCLA. I got into higher education. That's what I'm doing now. I'm Dean of Undergraduate Studies at Antioch University, which works with students all across the country, Los Angeles, Santa Barbara, and Seattle, uh, our campuses as well. I, was, I loved higher education, just being at UCLA, being involved with colleges. And so I became a campus tour guide as a student. And that is what led me to my career, that I just fell in love with talking to people about colleges, about the access and equity that was possible at UCLA. And I decided to go on and pursue my master's and my doctorate in higher education. And after that, I was involved in all areas. If people are interested in any part about working for a university in the student affairs or student services side, I wore, was the registrar, I was a director of admissions, I worked in advancement, I worked in student services uh, while I was getting my doctorate and became faculty and have taught uh, undergrad completion courses as well as in graduate psychology and graduate education. Uh, my doctorate was in high, um, racial attitudes of students and how college can help uh, get people more interested in social activism and contributing to greater racial tolerance. And it is really just a huge passion of mine to be involved in just all the ways that college can transform you. And my, as Julie mentioned, I have a son who is a UCLA grad in geography, and he went on to work. Uh, he's working for the Forest Service now that he did some GIS classes as part of his degree, and that really helped him get that first job there. And then I have a high school senior who is deciding between UCLA and Berkeley right now so we'll see what <laughs> so that's a tough one but uh yeah if anybody's interested in anything having to do with higher ed certainly uh I reach out I'm very happy to talk about all of my experiences uh, in that whole range of uh higher ed that is quite the tour of duty thank you so much Dr. Hoon all right uh Michelle Thomas you're up next Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for first, let me um, say thank you to uh, PAA for inviting me to, you know, participate in this. Um, I am originally from California. Um, I moved to Hawaii about five um, plus years ago, I'll be about six years in May. Um, and I moved here 
due to my job. Uh, basically, I received the uh, job offer that you really can't refuse. Um, and, you know, had to make that decision to move to Hawaii um, in order to be able to pursue my career a little bit further. Um, essentially, right now, I am the Chief Human Resources Officer for the Board of Water Supply here in Hawaii. Uh, we have uh, our organization has um, a little under 600 employees, and um, I have a staff of nine that help me um, handle all of the functions for the human resources, basically anything and everything that's related to em employees and people that happen at the organization. Um, we have everything from blue collar uh, employees to scientists and to engineers and other professional staff. So the human resources function actually um, does the entire gamut of what you can do in human resources. And um, I report directly to the manager and chief engineer for the Board of Water Supply. Um, you may, he, we have been in the news quite a bit recently um, due to some uh, different things that have been happening with the military and, um, and whatnot. So you may see some information in there and occasionally see me um, on TV as part of one of those uh, type of reports that's happening and dealing with those types of things. Um, originally, um, I went to San Diego State for my bachelor's degree, I was a double major in Spanish and Chicano studies with an emphasis in border studies and a minor in Asian studies. What that basically means is I was in all things ethnic studies um, back in, at that time, which is definitely a far cry from what I am doing now. Well, I wouldn't say a far cry, but it's definitely a, a different from what I'm doing now. Um, I went to UCLA. Um, to get my certificate in human resources management. And I was able to complete that in 2014. And at the same time, I also completed my um, master's degree in leadership and organizational studies at Azusa Pacific University. Um, after all of that, I also became certified in um, as a senior professional and human resources through the Society of Human Resources Management. Um, and this all came to a culmination because of the fact that I felt it was super important to be real legitimate in the human resources field. My um, career progression actually went from me being a probation officer right out of college to, um, and being a substitute teacher, you know, when I wasn't working um, in the juvenile halls or out in the field at the time. And then um, taking all of that, you know, experience and then parlaying it into, you know, doing administrative work and eventually coming into human resources as my main career. I was able to really, you know, take all of those experiences and put them together in order to be able to make myself, you know, a really functional person when it comes to human resources and understanding the human element that comes to career. And, um, you know, I think it's really helped um, understanding how regulations can play into how people can be successful in their careers. And, um, you know, one of the things that I think that a lot of people don't understand is that, you know, your progression through your career, through your education life and all that can lead you to interesting places, provided that you're willing to take the opportunities. And so, um, you know, I it will be a pleasure to continue to talk to you folks about my background. Um, my other pursuits include, um, I'm currently a member of the PAA Scholarship Committee. We're always looking for other members. So if you guys are interested, uh, please uh, let us know. And I was a former board member for the PAA um, as well. So that's a brief uh, information about me. <laughs> nice to meet everybody. Thank you so much, Michelle. Really glad you're here. Okay, up next, Roselma. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Roselma Samala. And yes, me and Jenny are related. Um, <laughs> we just knew that recently. Um, I'd like to, um, I am the daughter of Elmer Samala and Lita Garcia, and I bring them into the space the way that we brought in um, the tribes of the Tongva. I'm here in downtown Los Angeles acknowledging them, um, because if it wasn't literally for my parents and 
um, their parents before them and so on. Uh, without my ancestors, I wouldn't really be where I am today and have the onus to be who I am today. Um, I graduated in 1996 from UCLA with a sociology, Asian American studies uh, major and um, pre-med, uh, similar to others here. Uh, uh, I thought I was going to be a doctor, but um, seeing that I would have to be in school for another like five or six years, I couldn't do it anymore. Um, so my trajectory also sort of changed. Um, I also got my MBA from Yale, and um, it's really from there that I uh, started the career that I have currently, which is in philanthropy. So I do a grant making um, for uh, family foundations or for um, private uh, foundations. And um, if it really wasn't for UCLA, I also wouldn't have started a business. Um, I started um, a bar called Geneva um, in historic Filipino town with two other uh, UCLA alum, uh, two other Filipino women, actually. We met through Samahong. Um, I have a strong connection to UCLA without it, without Uncle Roy, without um, a lot of the people who are on this panel. Actually, I wouldn't be uh, where I am. And I do see a lot of the themes of, um, you know, being open to opportunities, uh, taking that journey, uh, leading with your values, and all of that uh, wouldn't have happened without my time as an undergrad, uh, as a Bruin. So, um, so thank you to talk more about that. Um, but uh, if I can say anything, uh, UCLA allowed me to create a life and a career um, of my own without having to stick to the rules, and I encourage that for anyone. Thank you for inviting me and looking forward to meeting everyone. Amazing. Samala is represented well on the panel and in historic LA Filipino historical town. All right. Um, I think, Julianne, you mentioned that Dr. Antonio Moya is on with us. Yes. Okay. We'd like Please. to um, invite him. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Great. Um, my name is Antonio. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here with uh, fellow Bruins. Um, so uh, I am a practicing neurologist in Los Angeles. Actually, I've gone to the dark side. I'm a, a assistant professor of neurology at USC, but I also train the uh, Harbor UCLA residents as well in neurology. Um, it's nice to be back in LA. So before this, I was actually um, uh, in fellowship at LA with a uh, fellowship called the National Clinician Scholars Program. It was also called the Robert Wood Johnson uh, Foundation um, Scholarship. And um, in that time, I'd really focused on stroke advocacy for Asian Pacific Islander community. If you all remember the Tagalog class at UCLA with uh, Pembita or Tita uh, Domingo, uh, she was actually one of the uh, actors, the, the main actor actually for the uh, PSA that we did on stroke and it was actually shown uh, globally through the Filipino channel. Um, before that I was also in New York so I had done neurology residency at uh, the New York Presbyterian Weill Cornell uh, residency program and was also working at uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering which is the, the the main cancer center around Upper East Side Manhattan and then even before that I was in San Francisco at UCSF it was a joint uh, UCSF uh, Harvard MD MPH program. And that's when I was a prime student, which was kind of a, a special program for UCSF students who wanted to work with urban underserved communities. So during that time, I spent a lot of time in uh, Soma, Filipinas or South of Market in the Philippines. And um, it was at uh, Mabu Mabuay Health Center. I don't know if you all have heard of that center. So a lot of the work that I've been doing has really been involved with uh, getting to know the local Filipino community um, after I had graduated from UCLA, um, I lived in the Philippines for a year. Um, my Tagalog is not as good as it was before, but I, I had done a, a Fulbright Fellowship studying acute stroke units uh, throughout the country. So I've kind of been like that example of the person who's like persistently stayed with the things that I've liked because I, I was a neuroscience major back at UCLA and I, I stuck through that um, since I'm now doing neurology. But uh, back at UCLA, I was also a... Um, really into music as a lot of Filipinos are into uh, it as well. And I played uh, alto sax with the Latin jazz uh, group back at UCLA. 
and uh, still keep in touch with the groups at UCLA, like the UCLA PAA and uh, Filipinos for Community Health as well. I think I'm going to be uh, talking with them and it, this actually this month. <laughs> but anyway, it's a it's a pleasure to see you all, um, and I'm excited to to get to know you all too. Awesome. Thank you so much. And to all of our esteemed panelists, we're very grateful that you're here sharing your expertise. I'm going to go ahead and turn this back over to you, Julianne. All right. So let me just get back to where we were. There you so go. It seems so. I'm just the first question I'm going to ask is for the people, for those who have changed their major or their path right? What, what was it that precipitated that change? Was it, I mean, in all transparency, was it just a change of heart? Uh, did you take another class that just opened your eyes and said, ah, oh, I really want to be an artist? Just so, you know, like, so with Danny de Jesus, could you talk to that? Sure. Um, you know, it's interesting. I think I've been really thinking a lot about this and it sounds as if a lot of you have as well in terms of being the child of immigrants, being the children of Filipinos and the, of course, the love and the expectations that our parents have on us in terms of what that means to be successful, right? So I remember in third grade deciding that I was going to be a doctor so that I could take care of my parents. And I stuck with that goal and that profession all throughout elementary school and high school. I worked really, really, really hard to get the grades that you all know we need to be able to get into UCLA. And I went in as a pre-med student, a majoring in biology. And it is kind of no joke. I'm being for real, you know, also being the daughter of Catholic um, very strict immigrants. I had no life in high school. And then I go to Hedrick Hall my freshman year and I have a life and I have freedom and I can actually, I don't have a 12 o'clock curfew anymore. And I'm being able to meet people and do things that I never did. And I was that total nerd in high school that just studied and, and did all the extracurricular activities and got the great grades. And so Come, come college and come UCLA, I was like, whoa, what is this thing called like life? And it's just an outside experience. And so then when I started to realize what it would actually take to be a doctor and no joke, the OCHEM thing was real. I saw people in the, um, you know, the study lounges drooling over their textbooks at 3 a.m. And I'm like, I did that in high school. I don't know if I wanna do that anymore. And so it was a little bit of just like, okay, like who did I ever actually really want to be a doctor? And where did that dream come from? And where did that idea come from? I'm still fascinated by health and wellness. I'm a licensed yoga teacher. I'm a licensed massage therapist. And so that's part of my DNA. Um, but I also thought and knew that I hadn't really explored any other options and ideas. So this is also something I think is important for us as um as human beings, but especially if you're a student trying to figure it out is not limiting yourself to what it is that you thought you needed to be doing at this part in your life, especially because our parents and our families, and we know this being Filipino, have such a great influence um, on us, of course, because they love us and only want the best. Um, but that's when I said, okay, well, I need to try other things. I need to explore other options. And so, yes, I was taking other classes and just getting super stoked. I was realizing that a lot of things that I wanted to do had to do more with um, the social aspects of, of, of experiences and of life. And so then I started playing with the idea of going into law enforcement. And I was a huge X-Files fan, don't make fun of me. So of course the FBI and all of these things. So I started taking other classes and enjoying them. And um, that took me in a completely different direction. And like I started earlier is then realizing that I had a wide variety of interests and I wanted to study so many things. So what did that look like and how can I make that happen at the time that I was at UCLA? Um, and to be honest, even as an educator, which was really super interesting, I had no desire to be a teacher at all throughout college, not one little iota, but I fell into an education class. I can't even remember how, and I loved the classes so much 
that I decided just to go have it as a minor, still not thinking at all that I would ever be an education, an educator. And it wasn't until after I graduated and I did this volunteer trip in West Africa after um, that I found at the Expo Center. I don't know. If, I don't think the Expo Center exists anymore, but you all remember the Expo Center. It was there. Then that's when I fell into teaching and decided that it was something that I loved. So again, like so much of what I think happens in college and why it's important to have an open heart and open mind is that you just never know what you're going to be introduced to. And there's so many things at UCLA, um, so many opportunities, so many experiences. And I know that can get overwhelming for sure as well. Um, but if you open up your heart, open up your mind, you know, start really understanding who you are. As an educator, I tell my students all the time, like the greatest gift that you can give to yourself is to know thyself, is to, you know, really study who you are, what it is that gets you up in the morning, what are your passions, your dreams, your goals, and they might not always coincide with what your parents want, right? And then finding the opportunities that are out there. So that's my story. I'll pass it on to someone else. No, that's that's good. So then there we have some panelists who I looks like you found your passion already. Um, Mark Polito, you found your passion, you know, in in poli sci, and you wanted to do public service. And then with Dr. Moya, it seems like too you also found your passion too. So, um, I know it was difficult you know, as an undergrad to, to, to continue those classes. And also for, how do you speak to that, to, to keep your passion? Well, um, Julianne, I just wanted to kind of address that question because actually I, I wasn't a poli sci major. Oh, um, I am. But, but that's okay. Um, the, to, to the point of the question, I was a history and Asian American studies major and I was, uh, contemplating pursuing a PhD in history and teaching ethnic studies, like I had mentioned uh, earlier in my introduction about uh, that I was very, very much inspired by uh, folks like Uncle Roy, um, you know, who uh, I took the fall quarter of my freshman year, like the very first class I wanted to take was Uncle Roy, uh, because he was the whole reason why I um, pursued higher education because my sister was a Bruin before me and she had told me that she had taken this class about the Filipino American experience and myself uh, uh, being born and raised here in America knowing nothing about uh, our people's history here our contributions uh, to America uh, I very much was uh, eager to take that class um, but it was kind of uh, interesting that um, I decided to make a hard shift to politics and government and public service uh, the night of P-Grad. Uh, P-Grad is uh, the Filipino graduation at UCLA. And our keynote speaker that night was uh, Manong Philip Veracruz. And um, as we were getting ready to, to leave, to drive him back to Bakersfield, um, he asked me what I was gonna do. And he said, um, I, and I said, I, I I think I'm going to try and get a doctorate and teach. And he said, well, um, I went to America. I came to America because I wanted to get a college education, but I couldn't because I, I had to work as a farm worker to, to raise uh, my siblings back home in the Philippines and put them through college. But tonight I got a chance to speak at UCLA at the graduation ceremony. And um he said, you made that possible be because you got elected student body president and you seized the power. You used the resources in order to uh, create a celebration to celebrate our people. And um, he said, you should, you should pursue politics because we have no one in office. We have no representation. We have no seats at the table. No one has our voice speaking with a strong voice uh, advocating for our, our community. And, and so I attributed to that conversation with uh, Mano Philip Veracruz uh, the night of our graduation, a a Antoinette is same class, right? Uh, That's why the past 
30 years since I've been doing public service. Uh, but now, like I mentioned, uh, I, I, I feel I accomplished what I set out to do with that. Uh, but there's a, a new generation uh, that really doesn't know who Philip Cruz or Uncle Roy or a lot of the modern generation who died uh, when we were just coming up. So this is my way to give back. I hope that helps. That helps. Sorry about that. I was confused. <laughs> oh, that's okay. That's okay. I, I did uh, pursue a master's in public policy like Antoinette. Uh, so it's it's a blend of political science and um, policy analysis, uh, statistics, economics, et cetera. So it also speaks to the truth. Like we knew when people are saying, you know, you open your hearts and your minds and then something just pops in and as in your case, led you to your path, right? Most definitely. Okay. And Dr. Moya, your yeah. passion for neuroscience. Yeah, for sure. So um, I actually, I changed my major at UCLA, but it was really a change. I started off as a biology major, but then got really interested in neuroscience. And I think that was because of my love for music. I wanted to understand, like, why is it that, like, I'm obsessed with playing piano or, like, wanting to just spend my free time, like, writing out music or trying to compose things. But I kind of wanted to still be on that pre-med path. But the main thing that really happened... Uh, at UCLA and, and a lot of physicians kind of have this is that um, my Lola in, in uh, you know, Alongopo City had a pretty massive stroke and I had no idea what a stroke actually was. And I was just so surprised that it took her about like several days to get down to Manila uh, to receive any kind of care. Like she, she went to the Alongopo like local hospital, but she wasn't, it, it seemed like there wasn't a neurologist that was really taking care of her well. She ended up, you know, she was like a very, very successful businesswoman in the Longapo, but then after her stroke, she was bed bound, not able to speak. And that really angered me because I, I didn't know why nothing was done in that moment, you know. Um, at the same time, I was working in this, uh, this research group at UCLA called the St like Student Stroke Team and found out that there's acute treatments for stroke right, that could potentially reverse symptoms of the stroke if you go to the hospital quick enough. But in the Philippines, the resources are just not there, especially out if, if you're outside of Manila. Um, so that's what inspired me to really go into neuroscience and figure out, you know, why was it that my grandmother could no longer speak and she was paralyzed on the whole right side of her body and um, eventually, you know, died from complications from that stroke. After I graduated from UCLA, I actually wanted to go back to the Philippines and and study the systems of care, like the health systems of care as to why um, probably majority of the Philippines are not able to access acute stroke care. Only those who are living in Manila can really access that kind of medication and treatment. And that I kind of went down the rabbit hole of saying, well, you know, it's not all about medical treatment. That's like the tip of the iceberg. Actually, it goes back to kind of what are like the social determinants of health, right? What's their health literacy in terms of what a stroke actually is. And then that brought me to kind of the whole idea of, well, I, I wanna work in a county hospital where I can work with patients who actually don't have readily, readily like access to this type of information or treatment. Um, so I, I guess my, for, for any of the students out there, I always ask the folks in neurology, how do I tie in neurology with public health or you know, working with patients who maybe don't speak English as their first language? And a lot of the folks said, well, no, you can't really do that. Like you're in New York, your patient population is different. And the moment they told me that, I said, well, I need to leave New York and go back to LA and be with my family and be with the Filipino community. And um, as hard as it was, it, it is a really long road. It, it's a marathon to, to finish medical training. Like I, I luckily was eventually able to come back to LA. And um, actually today I had... I had like all my outpatient clinics were four Spanish speaking patients and one patient was speaking Tagalog. And I realized, wow, I was like, I was, I had the interpreters there, but I hadn't actually, like I, I could converse with them and speak with them. And that's kind of the training that I've always wanted going through residency. 
So I always tell them, you know, the medications only do so much. We need to talk about your lifestyle, your diet, all of these things. And like, call me anytime. I, I want to know what's happening because I know that my own grandmother and my parents who also had close to heart attacks and a bunch of other things didn't have that kind of experience when they were seeing their doctors in LA. Um, also, if you're pre-med, um, so I started an organization called the Council of Young Filipinx Americans in Medicine, CYFAM. I'll, I'll leave the website there. Um, but if you all are interested, uh, actually, Dr. C, if you're interested too, uh, we need mentors, uh, Filipinx uh, physicians to help kind of mentor the next generation of young Filipino doctors. Oh, that's amazing. Um, that would be something uh, we can connect on later. Yeah, for sure. Um, just to like echo kind of everyone's points. Um, for me, I opened my mind. I did a design class in uh, UCLA. That was the worst grade I ever got. I was a 55 on a paper and I was so depressed. <laughs> and um, anyways, uh, for me, I, you know, after college, uh, I knew it was somewhere medicine. I actually took four years off. I worked as a non-student tutor, TAing um, life sciences in UCLA. And that was a lot of fun. Um, so I do love, you know, that all of us kind of like education. And for me, I enjoyed educating, like tutoring and those sciences because it is tough. Um, anyways, for me now, um, kind of at this point where um, I enjoy medicine. I enjoy what I do. I love what I do. Um, enjoy taking care of my patients. But there's something kind of else that I've kind of like always had in the back of my head. And fortunately, um, based on my career choice, I'm able to. Um, have that flexibility and luxury to do to pursue those things. So kind of some things I'm working on is more on mental mental health. So for example, um, a lot of things that have gone through the training is pretty terrible, to be honest. Um, medical training is tough, not only just the studying aspect, but also the culture, the politics. Um, during pandemic, it was really rough on anesthesiologists and emergency medicine, but overall healthcare. Um, but, you know, you see a lot of death um, becomes normal. Um, but you also see the death in a lot of colleagues. Um, my first day of residency, one of our pain pain fellowship, um, I guess, trainees committed was found dead in the uh, parking lot, um, over overdosed on like a medication we give in the hospital. Um, a med student who didn't match committed suicide, uh, match for residency. Another, I am, you know all this death around me. And I was like, wow, this is terrible. Like, I don't know why this is happening. Um, but clearly it's a systemic issue. So kind of my, um, I guess, future is kind of more dabbled into mental health and kind of that aspect. So um, hopefully it comes to fruition, but we'll see. But that's kind of like my pursuits right now in terms of something outside of what my current job entails. Awesome. I have a question for Ivan and then I have a question for parents of college students right now. So for Ivan, how do you manage your time being a student, being heads of clubs and 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 then also being a fashion model? Yeah, so it all really comes down to communication at the end of the day. I will say for the modeling aspect, I have a very good relationship with my agent. So I, at the start of each semester, I send her my schedule and they try to work around um, not scheduling me for any castings, any shoots between my, or like during my classes. During times like Fashion Week, which only happens twice a year, you have something called the casting, which is right before all the shows for each city. Uh, I only, I'm only doing it in New York for now, but that changes with time. But basically for that week, um, I pretty much skip all my classes because the the way castings work is that you get told a rough schedule the day before where you need to go. Like I have an example. This season I had I started my day at 9 a.m. and I ended my day at 9 p.m. in terms of my castings. So you run from Midtown to Brooklyn to Queens to Jersey City to Uptown again the whole day just to see if you can get anything. But all my professors during that week were also very kind. I emailed them the, you know the day the week prior and I explained this is what I have to do I might not be one of your classes just because I have a casting I have this and they were all fairly understanding uh, I will say that going to a New York school I'm sure a lot of these professors have seen stuff like this before and are accustomed to people involved in various career fields outside of what they're studying 
So I think I got very lucky. Aside just the modeling aspect, I do find time um, with these clubs. I have great people that work with me. It's not just me by myself or um, me organizing everything. Again, it really does come down to communication. And there are times where I just have to tell people, hey, I don't have time for this. Can someone take over? Next time you need some help, I'll help you out. So I think there's really no shame in asking people for help. Sometimes you just can't do it. But I think prioritizing what needs to get done as quickly as possible is another thing. And you kind of learn that as you go. I will say that there were longer nights um, at the beginning, just trying to figure everything out. Obviously, I'm still in my first year. So I can't say I'm, you know, some seasoned vet in this. But over time, you know what needs to get done, what takes you the longest, what you can't do by yourself, what you can. So as I keep doing this and as I... I, I don't know how it's going to work if I get signed abroad, because then I would have to go for two weeks to this city, that city, depending how this all will work. But for now, I think there is, there's, you have to just find a system and a balance that works for you. I don't think there's necessarily like an equation that everyone fits into. Perfect. And so for Antoinette and for me, he being the parents of students, how do you support your students, your children? in their ongoing journey to finding themselves? Oh gosh, there's, um, you know, there, it's it's really funny because when my daughter was accepted at UCLA, I was like, I was so excited and that, you know, she was deciding amongst all these other um, UCs as well. But um, when she committed and I was like, well, you know, you could do this, you can join Samaha, you can do PCM, you could do all this, blah, blah, blah. And then she's, she stopped me and she said, you know, mom, you know, I, I need to make my own path. And I said, whoa, okay. <laughs> so I had to really take a step back and I said, okay, you know, sure. So, um, you know, she definitely made her own path. She, she actually joined um, the rowing team her first year and was, and I was like, you're, you're on the crew team, you're an NCAA athlete. I was like, wow, that's cool. And then, um, you know, she actually ended up finding her way to Samahang and doing PCN, which I was so thrilled um, and about. So I think, you know, just really giving her the space to kind of find what her own passion was about um, and supporting her in any way that I could. And I think what I see, I think a, a lot is mentioned tonight about mental health. And I do notice there's a lot of anxiety um, and these expectations that I think students put on themselves. So part of that is helping them to you know, ma navigate and manage those expectations, being supportive um, and just allowing them the, the freedom to make their own mistakes and learn from them. Um, let them handle things and, and learn how to do that. Um, and that's, that's the most I think that you can do for sure. But it, it's hard because, you know, as we all know, as I have now, I'll have three kids who are going to be in college or one's graduating, one's, as I mentioned, studying MCATs, which is like, as many of you mentioned, it's a whole process. And I've, I see that now because I would have no knowledge of that because I was a uh, North Campus poli sci major, and I was like, I, I can't even tell you what to do. <laughs> so, um, but you know, again, it's kind of like just being there to support them and uh, allowing them to make their own choices. Yeah, I think it's hard to know all the amazing resources and opportunities and not be the you know all the time. And I actually went to; they had an admitted students' night reception or maybe it was at Bruin Day and they said something to us about you've been in the driver's seat this whole time you're taking the places you're doing things you're telling and now you're not they're in the driver's seat and you're sitting in the passenger seat and as much as you're clinging <laughs> to the side of the car nervous about the left turn they're about to make or whatever they're doing you're sitting in the passenger seat and if you yammer at them the entire time you're only going to make them more nervous and it's not going to help them learn to be independent and drive. It's right. So I thought that was really helpful information. And then the other thing, I, I went to a, a seminar and they were talking about how when people are processing and they're coming to you for information, that you should be clear and ask them, what do you what do you want for me now? Do you want me to witness? Do you want me to help? 
or do you want me to distract? And to think about what your role is, that is you're having these new relationships with them as adults, that it isn't always about being helping and doing for them. It is asking them what, when we're having this conversation, when you're talking to me, which, what is it that you want for me? And being able to provide them the choice of how you're going to interact with them. I thought that was really useful way to think about how you respond. Very good. All right, this next question is for Jenny. So someone who's thinking about social work, why should someone go into social work? What did you, what do you love about it? Um, social, social work is a very multifaceted career. For example, I specialize in geriatric care and especially mental health, but the social workers also exist in spaces like nonprofits, the hospital, uh, universities, where we're at the counseling center at UCLA. We are, um, you know, we're out at, in the middle of the night with, um, you know, uh, crisis teams attending to the mental health needs of the community at all hours of the day. So we're really in various places. We're in education, we're in, uh, you know, like the psych unit of the hospitals, we're in skilled nursing facilities. Uh, we're teachers at universities. We're everywhere. So the beautiful th the beautiful thing about social work is that whether you have your MSW or you want to further your career and pursue licensure to become an um, indiv independent practitioner of psychotherapy, um, you know, there's lots of opportunities in different directions that you can go with social work. You know, so. That's a beautiful part about that career. And, uh, you know, I have lots of friends, um, not only from UCLA, but also Cal State LA that I'm still connected with today because we turn to each other for support and resources to serve our clients. And our clients come from all walks of life. You know, for example, as a mental health provider, I work with our Filipino elders, right? So, um, you know, I've worked with a lot of our lolas and lolos who, you know, maybe at one time uh, they were uh, business owners, they had a PhD, they had, uh, you know, they raised families, but because of what, uh, you know, how they've been coping with their mental health, sometimes you have everything one day and some sometimes you end up losing everything in one day. So, you know, uh, my experience in mental health has been a very uh, humbling learning experience. And, you know, these are the kinds of experience that um, I've been privileged to have as a social worker in my area of interest. And so, you know, um, you know, social workers are everywhere. We're in policy. We are, um, government officials. Uh, we work with the mayor's office. We're just really everywhere. We just, you know, the unfortunate part, though, is that in the um, hierarchy of the healthcare system, social workers are one of the most under-recognized healthcare workers. And I really want to change that because we are present, we are doing the work, but we don't get the as much rec recognition. So, yeah, like, I hope more folks would be interested because, for example, uh, right now, as a geriatric social worker providing mental health services, it's really hard for me to find another Filipino that provides similar services. So I need more social workers. <laughs> so <laughs> I would love to see more people in social work because it's a very beautiful career. You know, I... I had the privilege of, of, of listening to Jenny at the Dare to Soar event. Um, and you so impressed me. And so I just thought you would be a great, great resource for our students and to, to open our eyes to what social work can be, you know, mm -hmm. and you do important work. So, so thank you, thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question uh, for Michelle. 
because you are in HR management. And so now we have seniors on this, uh, some senior students, and I, you know, they're getting ready to maybe find a job or so what is your advice for those students, how to apply correctly to a job, how to, what's, what's, a, what's, a, what's some advice you would give the, those students? Okay, so here's what I'd say. One of my main things is read the question and answer the question that is asked of you. A lot of times I will see that, you know, in applications, in interviews, in different things, um, you know, either, I don't know if it's because of nerves or if it's because of just inability to pay attention or whatever. Um, but there's a lot of times where the information that's provided isn't actually answering the question that's been presented to you, whether that be on an application or an interview. And I find this severely happens a lot in the actual interview process. Um, so what you need to do is just pay attention to what's being asked of you and give as much information as you can, um, particularly through the interview process, because of the fact that, you know, they most hiring managers will see hundreds of, of actual resumes at any given time. They'll look at the resumes and they see what you put down as, on paper. And when you're going through the interview process, that's your opportunity to you know, really shine, to really you know, pat yourself on the back, say, this is what I do, this is who I am, this is why you should be able to uh, choose me. And if somebody asks you for something like, give me one instance or one scenario or one example, they are asking you for one example, one instance, one, one situation, so that way they can really gauge whether or not you know what you're talking about, whether or not you do have that you know, experience moving forward. It frustrates me to no end when I sit into, uh, you know, interviews or read applications and I ask them a question and they, you know, especially something like, you know, give me one instance of when you had a difficult customer, how did you handle that person? And you're not able to say that or somebody goes and says, well, I've never really had that situation. That's not true. Everyone has had difficult situations. Everyone has had, you know, situations that they can provide as an example, even if it's the most little example, as long as you're able to actually convey it in an articulate way, and you're able to actually link that to the job that you're applying for, that will give you a head, leg up on a lot of other individuals that you're going to be applying for. Additionally, I would also say, you know, research what you're looking into. For example, I work in public service. Uh, the applications for public service are notoriously long. They want you to provide every single detail of what you have done in your life, and that will actually be able to be reviewed to determine whether or not you meet the minimum qualifications for that position. Then when you go through the interview process, that's where you provide additional information to link it specifically to why you are the best candidate for that job. When it comes to private industry, they may not want all of that detail. So research all of that actual position that you're applying for, research the company, know what they do, and really, you know, look into what you, what that actual hiring manager is looking for. A lot of times, all of the things that they're looking for is actually listed in that job announcement, in that posting. And really, you want to key in on those things. Now, don't copy it and don't go in, you know, just say, I have these things. Provide concrete examples to be able to support and show that you actually can do this job, that you have the experience to do it, and that you have the knowledge, skills, and abilities to do what is necessary to be successful in the future for that organization? Oh my gosh, we need just a pan we need a webinar just with Michelle. Talk about all that stuff. Love it. Last, well, Roselma, I'm going to put you on the spot now. <laughs> Please bring back some form of Geneva. Okay. Um, <laughs> if I know, it's in the works. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, but kudos to you. You left the way that you wanted to leave and you, you had that power. Um, you're a business owner. Yes. How tough is that? Because you're in one of the toughest sector, right? Mm -hmm. The food and, and drink. Yeah. Owning Liquor. a business. Yeah. <laughs> how, 
from UCLA, do you have anything from UCLA that helped you in, as a business? I mean, you know, your your support system, your your mental fortitude. You're being uh, a Bruin. Yes, <laughs> all of it, all of it. Um, yes, uh, owning your business is uh, not for the faint of heart. It requires a lot of patience um, and that support network as well. You know, I'm very grateful that um, I was able to do this with with two friends. And, you know, they always say, don't start a business with friends. And we heeded that warning and we were very conscious of that. Um, but we reminded each other all the time that we are friends. <laughs> and if it felt like we weren't going that way, we would take a little break. But um, in all honesty, I think it made us uh, closer. And um, uh, if, if any of you have been to Geneva, um, to the bar, um, a lot of our success is from the community. Um, one is that uh, we were very close to SIPA. So um, all of us had ties to SIPA, either as a volunteer or directly, you know, working at the office in some capacity. And um, we were able to um, not be familiar, not only be familiar with the community, but work um, uh, with uh, the, the community resources that helped us. We worked with, um, uh, I can't remember the name of it right now, but it's a small business program amongst Asian nonprofits. And, and they really helped us navigate some of the, um, the politics of uh, the different communities. Um, we also did a Kickstarter um, and um, it, you know, it literally like, presented itself as a mural where we put a lot of our Kickstarter supporters names on, on the wall. And um, it was that support that not only provided us financial support, but also um, uh, the word of mouth, the love that we got from our community and supporting us, wanting us to be successful, um, being there with us through the good times and the bad, um, aka COVID. Um, you know, we were closed for two and a half years, but um, you know, it was as it's also what we learned as students. Um, you know, I was really involved with Samahang, a spear counselor, PCN. I did, I did everything, um, but. I think just um, through that community, the support to, as I mentioned earlier, to um, have a, a vision that is your own, like you don't need to follow a box set out for you, was really what uh, the time at UCLA supported us in doing. Um, you know, I never thought I would start my own business, uh, but I... I was at a job that um, didn't respect me as a woman of color, and I wanted to figure out how to get out of there and advocate for other um, communities, which was a leading value in everything that I do, which through UCLA, through my work with the community, through exposure to other types of jobs besides being a doctor, um, that came out of me, that evolved from me. And... Um, and, and also through, you know, connecting with my history as, um, you know, as I mentioned, I honored my ancestors, knowing and, and tapping into my ancestors uh, entrepreneurship um, also helped me um, continue this journey. Um, you know, I, I, it's, it's, it's everything um, and anything that you do, um, there's uh there's that community there, however you define it, whether it's your blood family, your chosen family, your professional, your personal, um, there's so much value to who is in uh, your network or who is in your, your support group. And that's why I loved, um, you know, what Mihi said about, you know, do you need me to witness, help, or distract? I love that because that's with anything that we do, we need people like that for us. I hope that answered the question. <laughs> that was great. No, no, no. That was really, really good. Uh, everyone's great. Um, so does anyone have any questions, especially from our students? Uh, or do, do we have questions for other people? Like, anyone? 
Anyone? Any jokes? Um, I have one question. Yes, Bernadette. Um, as a recent graduate, I was just wondering um, if anyone has advice about the best way to use your gap years. Um, right now, I'm looking into more and more internships, but did you spend more time exploring, um, building your resume, or maybe just going on vacation and traveling? I I'd love to hear about that. Yeah, I'll speak to that real quick because um, um, I did want to say how like um, I went to grad school outside of California and born and raised in Southern California and um, and just traveling really helped um, open my eyes to how other things or how the world sees other things, um, how the world is paced outside of the U.S. and how you can have a fulfilling life without that grind that we continually have and and how um, countries support that often. Um, and so I feel like traveling really gets you out there and, and just having that experience, even if it's not related, I think, to uh, something that you wanna do. I mean, that's what I found the value of the, our undergrad degrees, right? It's like, you could do whatever you want and, and it may or may not, but it's, it ultimately will guide you in some form or fashion. Um, so I would, uh, I value so much like my travel experiences because that's also been able to open up opportunities and open up possibilities as well. And I, and I, and I just also wanted to say like, um, I know that this generation is like, they're very um, entrepreneurial itself but I do appreciate the time that I worked for other people or worked in businesses because um, without that, I think I also wouldn't have known what, what it fully means to be whole or what, what it fully looks like to, um, uh, to know what, like what, um, what I value and what is good for me and everyone around me. Bernadette, what was your major? I majored in psychology. Psychology. What I was a psychology also, major? Yeah, oh, go ahead, me. I, I work with a lot of grad students in psychology. Uh, you know, I would also say keep taking classes, whether they're for credit or, uh, you know, just personal growth and development. I think those can open a lot of different avenues that you might not otherwise think about. And because you've got the gap year, you know, you might think about, well, if I was going to do further graduate work, are there certain courses? Are they asking for statistics class or a development class that I didn't take as an undergrad? The things that might lead you to other fields that you may or may not have considered, um, you know, or maybe just the class you always wished you would have taken as an undergrad and didn't have time to take. I think those can be ways that you keep your yourself growing and also thinking about other other ways and, and professions you might not otherwise have considered. I would I'll also add that, you know, education is a lifelong thing. I mean, to this day, I watch, you know, webinars and do continuing education units on a regular basis because you kind of want to make sure that you're always up to date on what your industry is doing, if that's really where you have your passion and that's where you want to, you know, succeed in your life. Because Eventually, you do have to make that decision. Where do I want to go? What do I want to be? And everything. And in order to be really successful in that area is to stay up to date, right? Um, and I mean, like I have, you know, a dual bachelor's and a master's degree, and I'm certified in a bunch of stuff, but it doesn't matter because every single day I'm learning something new. And I think that's the thing is you want to keep that mindset. Um, oh, there's one, there's a thing that you know, I like to kind of tell other staff members, or particularly like my staff and everything, there's this concept of completed staff work, right? And this concept of completed staff work, it is a thought process of you understanding that there's always a beginning, middle, and an end. And if you are a good staff person to someone else, you will do what you need to do at the beginning, middle, and an end. So that way you are supporting whomever is above you that needs that information so they can be successful and in turn see that you are a good person to have on their team, essentially, right? And that completed staff work may not just be, you know, giving them whatever 
answer that they're looking for. It may be going the extra mile to see, oh, well, this is the answer to this, but this is what I would recommend and why, right? And, and this, it, that, you know, helps you be more collaborative on a team basis. It also helps you be able to be more valuable and people actually want you on their team, right? And that's what you're really looking for. I'm, I'm also going to say this because from personal experience, it's also good to kind of slack off a little bit. I mean, I slacked off a lot, but um, no, I like, I, I also enjoy just not doing anything and maybe, you know, you can find some time to just not do something and that might just get your juices flowing too, or get your inspiration going. Um, yeah, I think I, th I think the thing, Julianne, is like we all have multiple interests and multiple pursuits. And like um, Julianne can attest to this. I actually have a side business doing event planning and making wedding cakes and things like that. Right. And so, you know, you need to find your outlet and that outlet can be anything, you know. Mark Pulido. Yeah. So um, was it Vernadette who asked a question about um, yeah, gap year? Yeah. Um, so um, for my experience, I, I never had a chance to take a gap year. Um, I guess the closest experience that I could compare that to uh, were just the little gaps that, that I took, um, like summer, <laughs> spring break, um, weekends. Um, and, and what I did during those little tiny gaps, uh, or what I've been um, recommending to a lot of the students and recent graduates that I've been speaking to uh, re really over the past few years in the in the pandemic, I, I zoomed a, a lot with current uh, summer hungers and you know UCLA folks and um, and I told them this: uh, use your gap year or any gaps that you have. Uh, to step away from uh, campus and find mentors. Uh, and not just mentors in your chosen field, but just life mentors. And then uh, to kind of piggyback off of Roselma's uh, recommendation to travel, travel to visit your mentors. And, um, you know, my personal example is, uh, um, Kind of interesting, you know, this is over a UCLA alumni thing. When I was student body president in 93, the one of the awardees for the UCLA alumni award was uh, then Lieutenant Governor Ben Caetano. He's uh, Filipino from Hawaii. And um, he asked me the question too, so, so what are you going to do when you graduate? And I said, I have no idea. And he said, well, you know, uh, next summer I'm going to be running for governor. Uh, why don't you come out? help on my campaign. So I said, <laughs> why? Yeah. So I did that. Um, I kind of followed my then girlfriend, now wife, uh, who was moving out to go to grad school at UH Manoa. Uh, but I, um, I spent like two months working on his campaign. And, you know, it wasn't any formal education, but man, the things that I learned on that and being mentored by him, uh, really set me up for the next 30 years. Um, so if you're a psychology major, uh, I, you know, I don't know too much about psychology, but um, I just collaborated on this uh, this new publication called the Encyclopedia for Filipina OX Studies um, that just came out. And it was co-edited by uh, two psychologists. Uh, one, uh, brother Kevin Nadal out of New York. And another brother from Alaska, E.J. David, uh, and also sister Allison Tintianco Kubalis. Uh, she co-edited it also. Uh, but but the two brothers I mentioned are psychologists, and they've th done some incredible uh, groundbreaking research uh, focused on our people. Uh, so if you have continuing interest in psychology, I'd say tr travel to Alaska and travel to New York. <laughs> Uh, to pick those uh, brothers' minds, uh, and maybe they will uh, help mentor you. 
uh, and maybe you'll mentor them. Thanks. This has been great. I'm gonna, it's 8.30, but I want to have Michelle, since she did raise her hand, speak a little bit, and then um, uh, we will call it a night. Um, what, I would, what I would say is that I wanted to add to what Mark had said, you never know what you're going to be interested in and you're not going to know, you know, when you're right out of school, what you want to be when you grow up, so to speak. Um, like, you know, my bachelor's degree was in something completely different than what I, you know, do today. And I actually was a probation officer when I started right out of uh college, right? So I thought I'd be in law enforcement for the rest of my life, right? Because usually that's what happens when you go into law enforcement. But the fact of the matter is, is your interests change as you grow older, you learn a lot more as you grow older, and you become more passionate about certain things. Mark became passionate, passionate about serving the people, right? And I became passionate about helping employees be able to be successful in their jobs, right? And you never know where it's going to lead you. The, by talking to those mentors, learning from those mentors, and really just getting those experiences, like Mark was saying about those opportunities, small opportunities that you might get, you, that's how you learn more about yourself. And that's also how you learn about what your passions are, which also will drive you to learn more, right? And for you to be more successful. So, you know, it's always a good thing when you have a passion for something, because then it makes you want to put more effort into it. And, you know, kind of to round it out is, we all have like a lot of different competing priorities. You know, I have a mom, I'm a mom, I have a son who's in college. I have, you know, uh, the stuff I do with PAA. I also have my work stuff and my other personal pursuits. But, you know, you make time for what you're interested in and what you're passionate for. And so, you know, I think things will fall into place as you move forward, provided that you follow your passions, you, you make it so that way, you know, work is less about the work, but more about, what you really, what drives you, so to speak. Uh, with that being said, so so I think if if students want to follow you or any of these panelists, I mean, if do you guys have Instagram pages or social media platforms that maybe students can log on to? You know. Um, but some people have already left, some panelists have already left their contact information in the chat. So please um, take it down if you guys want to. Um, I appreciate everyone for all of your time. You guys were, gave great information. I hope the students um, learned something and you know, at the very least know that we are your support system too. Uh, we we are alumni. We want to take care of you. We we want to help you succeed. 